welcome to the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have a pretty inspirational guest on the show, Mike Rosehart. Uh, to say Mike's an interesting guy would be an understatement. I remember seeing him on social media and wondering, what the heck is this guy doing? He's 24 years old. You're not 24, but you were when your, your story kind of stems from there. Uh, so Mike's done quite a few things, but most notably would be a, attaining financial independence and quitting your job at the age of 24, heavily driven through real estate. And uh, I know you've kind of switched gears since then. And I'm going to let you tell your story, Mike. But first off, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, it's been great to, to get on the podcast route. I've been jumping on a couple of podcasts and having a lot of fun with YouTube lately. So yeah. yeah, yeah, you're all over social media. And uh, I, I've been planning on asking you and then you reached out to me and it was perfect timing. So it's nice to get you on here. Just to start off, Mike, tell our listeners and viewers, because we'll be on YouTube as well, what you've been up to kind of your backstory, how the heck did you end up, quote unquote, retiring at 24 years old? <laughs> yeah, so my background in a, I guess, a short sort of little three minute story would be I guess at 17, I went off to Western University here in London, Ontario, and kind of discovered the fire movement. I grew up very poor, single mom, you know, she didn't make more than 15 bucks an hour, kind of minimum wage lifestyle. And I knew then that I wanted to be independent of the need for a paycheck, because you'd get a paycheck, you'd have a good time, and then the money would run out, and we'd be waiting for the next paycheck. As we grew up, you know, we'd move around a lot and stuff. And I didn't want that for, for myself and my family. So at 17, I was driven, extremely driven more than more than most I think that's why I worked through university I had pretty much always a full-time job it allowed me to graduate school debt-free bought my first property at 19 so uh, I kind of house hacked that by renting out rooms and I renovated it and sort of learned real estate through trial by fire I guess I had a lot of failures a lot of bad contractors I hired and a lot of problems along the way that you know you get better as you do more of it and graduated from Richard Ivy School of Business at 21 took a full-time job working at uh, an IT uh, business consulting firm. And they did really well there. Got promoted from analyst to senior analyst to manager. So I got three promotions and uh, basically quit my job at 24. And the whole time I was there grinding from you know 19 to 24, I acquired uh, 17 properties. So I did, I think a lot, of, a lot of people in the community now that I'm reaching out to have done what I've been able to do. You know, the Burr method, be able to get 10 plus personal properties without doing any joint ventures. But I think the thing that's special about my story is that I'm extremely focused on frugality, where mm -hmm. most people you know, spend a little bit more. I spent nearly nothing by house hacking. And right. that frugal nature kind of allowed me to reach financial independence. Effectively, I could replace all of my income with uh, you know, my net worth, even without real estate. If I sold my net worth off, put it in a dividend portfolio, I could live off just the dividends. And so that's when I pulled the trigger. I said, wow, you know, I've, I've gotten to a point here where I've got over a million bucks. Uh, from, from just working really hard and, and doing really well in real estate and saving it all. And that was for me a really big moment where I'm like, wow, you know, we've made it. Um, my wife and I, you know, we were at the point where we both quit our jobs and it's like, no one's done this at 24. And so I kind of, I was like, you know, I'm going to take to social media, start sharing the, the gospel. Yeah. I'd been reading, you know, early retirement extreme and Mr. Money Mustache and all of the guys in the financial independence space. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be kind of, I'd been kind of making my own path in real estate I found like bigger pockets around that time and started to discover some of the other real estate, uh, you know, podcasts and things, but there wasn't a lot out there when I first got started. Like you probably remember in 2011, 2012, I bought my first property. There was nothing on the internet where people were talking about the burr. The burr didn't even exist. So we kind of had to yeah, it's new terminology. Yeah. It's like maybe yeah. 2016, I started hearing it being thrown around, but before that, most people didn't even, didn't really talk about it. There was this path that you could effectively renovate a property and unlock all the equity and then buy another yeah. one. And so kind of, I had to trailblaze where there wasn't a lot of learning. And today people are very fortunate they get the chance to learn. And so in 2016, yeah. 2017, I started getting on social media a bit more on Facebook and doing daily video journals. And I had a bit more time on my hands since 2017, I had quit my job. And so yeah. I just decided to jump to social media. Eight months ago, I started a YouTube channel that was in 2018 and now we got over 7,000 subscribers and my, one of my more recent videos has like almost 50,000 views. It's going really, really well. I'm super excited that it's going so well. And uh, yeah, I've just been taking to social media to share the, share the learnings, right? At this point, it's not about the money for me. It's, it's more about mm -hmm. giving back, right? And, and it feels really good when people reach out and say like, Mike, I bought my first property because of these videos I watched or because of 
you know, something you shared and, or, you know, I had two properties and you explained to me that I can refinance them and buy two more. And those sorts of messages that I get, the feedback loop is amazing. So I, I encourage everyone to get on social media and share what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, obviously not everyone's starting where you're, uh, where you're uh, at right now, but I mean, For wherever sure. you are, share your journey. It's part of your brand too, right? Yeah, I, I really do enjoy some of the videos. I haven't seen all of them, obviously, but I've seen uh, some of your your messages and I had a, a good overall understanding of what it is that, that you preach, which I think is amazing. The uh, the frugality and being able to, to save what you make. You know, some people uh, say money saved is money earned. I, I do agree, especially it's, it's actually better. And you've even pointed this out because you pay tax on money earned, but you don't t- you don't pay tax on money saved. So yeah. If you can find a, dollar, a way, a dollar earned is equivalent to almost two dollars saved. So I've always said that, and it's really like three dollars saved because not only do you save for retirement faster, but you need a lot less in retirement. If you can cut your spending from say sixty thousand a year to thirty thousand a year, yeah, then you need half of the retirement portfolio. So you go from needing say two million dollars to retire to needing only a million dollars. So you yeah. get way faster, and that's how you can retire in your in your twenties. There's a guy that you need to look up. He's he's like your protege. I'm gonna. Give me one second here because I'm gonna I'm gonna find his name. He's 16 and he just bought his third property. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been hanging out with uh with Tyson. Tyson, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you guys have you know I got lunch. Yeah. It has got a really interesting story. Um it, it's interesting. I didn't even realize that you could I guess his parents bought the real estate, qualified for the yeah. mortgage, and they have it in trust to him, which is a sweet concept. Yeah. Uh, with his, he'll be graduating, I think, high school early, which is really cool. Um, now, what's your thought with this? Because you and I both went to the same school. We both went to the Ivy Business School. Insanely expensive. And yes. granted, there's a hell of a lot of polish that comes with a business degree. For is sure. it worth it, in your opinion, to get a university degree? It depends when on my journey you asked me. Um, today, I would say it is. But that's because I pivoted into doing real estate in a big way. Like, you know, I'm buying one to two properties a week now. We're building a, a fairly sizable um, portfolio with investors. And we're doing it mostly just to help them get to fire. A few friends kind of tapped me on the shoulder in July of last year and said, you know, can you help us buy some properties and give us most of the profit and you manage it and use your magic skills and coordinate everything. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I'll do it. I'm retired. I got nothing better to do. So we did that. And, so and you then came out of retirement is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. So I, I had 17 properties. I sold 11 of them off and retired. And I, I raised basically a million bucks outside of real estate. And mm-hmm. just like, I'm going to have four or five properties and keep my million bucks outside and, and just, you know, stay back from the real estate stuff. But, uh, you know, I got a friend pulled me in and next thing I knew yeah. we're, we've got like 50, 60 properties now. That's amazing. Um, so, so you're not a pro or against school right now. It's, is it, is it up to the individual? It's yeah. I, I can't really give a good, it depends on my mood. I guess if I'm thinking about my mood today, I would say it's been worth it. I've had some really good connections in the last few weeks out of the IV network. So yes. that's been that's been super beneficial. It's probably the first time I've seen the fruits of the IV labor. Yeah. You know, that it's like twenty eight thousand a year or whatever for tuition now these well, days. It's gonna point that out as well. Like it's you know, most people going to school, it's it's not that expensive. You going to school there and I know that I know you're paying, like it's expensive. Like I still have student loan from that. <laughs> Oh, wow. Paying off very slowly. Yeah, I'm in no hurry because it's cheap yeah. money, but, right, right. but you know, it's all, it's all leverage, right? It, it makes it all that much more impressive. I will say that the thing I feel like I got out of it was that polish. There's a network there and there's so many benefits that come from that. So uh, I can definitely uh, agree with you on that standpoint. I think the, the knowledge, you know, the knowledge is nothing special. You could find that all on the internet. Pretty yeah. much everything that we learned from the textbook perspective, you could pick up on the internet or from a, a good textbook. But I like the way, like the case-based methodology with Ivy is great. And that you get to, yeah. one of my favorite classes was entrepreneurial finance. My second favorite class was wealth management. Actually, they're probably tied for my first favorite classes. They were actually applicable. Like wealth management, the, the practices, understanding how RSPs and TFSAs work and doing an RSP to TFSA melt and all these things that I learned. Hey friends, I just wanted to jump in and explain a couple of the terms that have been thrown out so far. So TFSAs and RSPs, for those of you who are not from Canada, are equivalent to 401ks and other registered investments that you might have in your home country. And then the FIRE movement is financial independence, retire early. There's a FIRE movement that uh, occurs online. And uh, this was the inspiration for Mike, as he will talk about in a moment and carry on. In that course, very valuable. Entrepreneurial finance, again, hugely valuable. We did a lot of real cases where we analyzed businesses. And now I'm looking at buying 
businesses today and I can say, wow, yeah. you know, I've analyzed a hundred businesses in, in case methodology with the group sharing, um, you know, cross pollination mentality. Yeah. It really does help. There is some value with that. Is it worth, you know, the, the extra 60,000. So if you take like that 60 grand and you basically invest it at like 8% or 10%, it'll cost you about 2 million bucks in opportunity cost plus additional tuition by the time you reach 65. So the question is, are you gonna get $2 million in value? And I think probably half of people do and half of people don't. Yeah. Coming out of the IB program. So it really depends on the type of person you are. In my case, growing this big real estate property management, asset management company that we have going now, that definitely is gonna, you know, as we get to 100 million assets under management, 500 million assets under management, I think that the IB connection is gonna pay off in a big way for me. Yeah. So it's probably gonna be worth it for me. But had I just retired at 24, worked, you know, I worked like three and a half years in a full-time job and did real estate, which wasn't really applicable to anything I learned at IB. I, I didn't apply a lot of the, a lot of the concepts I learned at IB to my real estate portfolio. So I, I guess if I just retired at 24 and just was on a beach, it, I probably wouldn't have got a good return on my investment. Right. But I mean, I, I don't have any student debt. I, I graduated school debt free. So I'm, I'm, uh, I had to work really hard to pay for that, that no, tuition. I, one of the things that I think is uh, amazing is that it took me until 24 just to wrap my head around the fact, well, I wanted to get into real estate, but I was on the fence, right? I didn't have anyone around me. My family never did it. My backstory is fairly similar to yours. I, I remember very, very clearly my mother and father arguing at the, the dinner table when I was a child, like saying, you know, we don't have enough money for that. And, and those things stuck with me my whole life. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to do things differently because I don't want to, I don't want to live like that. I, I want to make sure that there's always more than enough. It's always abundant. I knew real estate was something I didn't know what, cause no one around me, school doesn't teach it. No one was doing it. So when I got in, it just so happened that my fiance's, my now fiance's mom was a mortgage broker that was badass real estate investor. And, uh, it was like a match made in heaven and that, you know, the stars aligned and that, that ended up happening. And then I ended up buying my first property at 24. You bought your first at 18. Was that right? 18 19, or 19? 19. 19. And just crushed productivity in that time frame. Like who did it around you? Was there anyone who gave you a little push or you just said, you know what, I'm onto something here. You know, my, my first property at night. So my dad did a little bit of real estate investing. I didn't spend a lot of time with him growing up, you know, the occasional weekend here and there. My parents split when I was like two, but uh, he used to buy some properties and I used to help him do painting and things like that on the weekends at his property and mow his grasses and stuff. And then he went through a divorce and sold off his real estate portfolio. Things okay. happened, right? So he, he got out of it and it wasn't really that, you know, fruitful for him. I remember him saying things like, you know, after everything was said and done after three or four or five years of owning property, he walked away break even on some deals. So there was like no appreciation in the London yeah. market back then, right? It was just like, you would hold it for a long time. You have a little bit of cash flow, and no one was talking about these 1% rule properties. People just bought what they, what felt nice. Like that was the, the common strategy. The realtors were always telling me like, buy what you're comfortable with. Don't just focus on cash flow. focus on what's easy, what's legal, what's, and so then I, I sort of was like, Hmm, I think there's something here with the cash flow model. If I focused on students, that's where I started my first property at 19. I thought, well, I know students, like I'm a student, I have a bunch of friends who are students. I feel like I could find a tenant to rent out these rooms. So I took a chance and learned. And then it took me two and a half years to buy my second one because I had to save up the down payment for my second one. And that was really hard. I was trying to finance myself through school. I got a lot of really good scholarships. I was really fortunate that, you know, half of my IB tuition was paid for by scholarship. And so that, that helped a lot. And because I was house hacking at 19 and rent hacking before that, I had no living costs through school. Mm -hmm. I rented a in second year a bedroom for two hundred and ninety nine dollars a month, all inclusive. My buddies were all paying five hundred, so I, I was just saving like crazy. And the the landlord would just like give me free food too. He had fruit in his fridge, and I would just we would just make meals together. And so I, I had really lean living costs, which allowed me to get through school. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you're right. There was no one really, no one really doing it at this time. No one I could find online. I remember reading in 2012, 2013, Mr. Ray Mustache, I came across his blog early on and he had an article or two about rental properties. And he sort of just mentioned, you know, I've been following the fire movement intensely, right? And I wasn't necessarily planning to go into real estate at all. I just, I thought, you know, real estate might be one of my asset classes in my portfolio. And it's one of those things where I, I think I saw the article and saw he's like, you can make $35 an hour. He basically broke out his time, what his time was worth to manage his properties. 
I remember him saying like 30 or $35 an hour. And I was like, wow, that's a good paying job. I'm yeah. going to go get a job in real estate and buy some properties, be self-employed with real estate. So I looked at real estate, not as passive income, but as yeah. an opportunity to spend more of my time. I'm like, Hey, I got a hundred hours a week. A full-time job is not enough for me. I need, yeah. I can work two full-time jobs, but my employer wouldn't allow that, but they'd allow me to buy real estate. So I just basically worked two yeah. full -time jobs from 19 through to about 25. Um, and that allowed me to basically in those, you know, six years or so I earned what most people earn in 15 or 20 years just because I was working so many hours. I wasn't necessarily working any smarter. I was making probably $25 an hour worth of time. And I guess from there, I just saved enough to buy my second property, realized with my second property that I was making like $40 an hour when I was doing the numbers in, in Excel. And I was like, wow, this is, I'm making more from this per hour than I am at my day job. So I, I thought, well, I'm gonna double down on this. So we just, my wife and I both went like all out, super frugal, saved 50% of her paychecks and 100% of mine and put it all into real estate and all the rental income from the properties send that bank account for that property and we reinvested. And then I realized this snowball method, I called it the Rose Heart snowball for a long time. Then I figured out there was this thing called Burr and it was, they're almost the same. Um, but I was like, I'm gonna call it this Rose Heart snowball, which is the idea that anyone can buy 10 properties in three years if they have seed capital of 100,000 saved up and they maintain 50% savings rate. Mine was predicated more on frugality and, and basically having a full-time job. But at 10 properties, you get, it gets hard to get more personal mortgages. So I figured 10 was like yeah. the, the easy cap, buy them all personal. And then at 10 properties, if you're averaging, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 in cash flow on the, on the average, that's, you know, that's like 10 grand a month safely. So most people can retire on 10 grand a month. So for a while, I was telling my friends at work, and I remember everyone just it was going right over their heads. They're like, wait, why are you working in the evenings? And like, wait, you work till midnight every night? That sounds terrible. Like, I feel bad for you. And it was just like, that was the continual, like I would share that with a friend and they'd yeah. be like, I feel bad for you. And then all of a sudden it exploded for me. I went from six properties to 12 because I burred all six of them at once. Just to clarify, burr stands for buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and repeat. And when I jumped and got a whole bunch more properties, people were like, holy crap, you have 12 properties. You're like 23, 24 years old. What happened, Mike? Because people weren't, you know, watching the, the grind, right? They were hearing it when I was telling them. But then all of a sudden they see the results and now everyone's interested, right? Once they see yeah. the results, they see the fruits, then all of a sudden people want to know. And it's not necessarily easy, but, um, you know, if you, if you do grind, I believe in hard work being the, the yeah. greatest thing. I wish I knew how to work smarter. Like you said, if I had had a good mentor, I had some good yeah. realtors that sort of influenced me over the way. And I'm sure the Ivy education helped a bit being very astute with how I crunch my numbers. So I was always finding really good cash flowing properties. Yeah, that was like main focus. It, it worked really well for me. I wish I had focused on appreciation more had I known the market was going to do what it did. Because I bought properties that didn't, I bought some townhouses and like semis and stuff that cash flowed really well, like 2% rule back in 2014. And that was like unheard of, right? People are like, why are you buying these properties and making all these bedrooms and trying to cash flow? Why don't you focus on buying properties that are going to appreciate well? And so I just didn't follow that appreciation mm -hmm. strategy at all. My strategy was always on cash flow. And, and so it was a little bit different strategy. All right. So a couple of things that I wanted to clarify, because uh, not everyone's going to be familiar with fire. You mentioned that uh, a couple of times now, and I should have, I should have asked you the first time. Could you just clarify what fire is and where you found that in the short, the, the Coles notes version? Sure. So fire is financial independence retired early. The fire movement kind of stemmed out of, there was like the financial independence subreddit and the retire early. And it kind of came together into one People were talking about early retirement in like 2008, 2009, 2010 with blogs like Early Retirement Extreme. That, I used to call it early retirement. At some point, there was, I think 2016, 2017, the term was more popularized and coined FIRE. So mm -hmm. it's the whole financial independence movement. It includes people on the lean FIRE side who want to spend a little bit of money and retire on a lot less. And it includes the fat FIRE folks who, want, who need like three, four, five million to retire and need that really abundant lifestyle. So it kind of encompassed everyone into one movement. And they call it like the fire movement. Yeah. So basically it's the notion of retiring early. That's, that's the whole drive behind it, right? If you have financial yes. independence, meaning your monthly expenses are covered uh, with, with your investments, now you no longer need to work. You can retire. That's exactly yeah. right. It, the, the term, yeah. the, the true definition, I guess, is you have 25 years of living expenses set aside. Okay. And then you can theoretically withdraw from that just the interest and never touch the principal. So as long as your interest can give you 4%, then you're good? Correct. If you could withdraw 4%. So you want to have a 6% total portfolio yield. So you can okay. leave 2% in there. So your payments grow over time. You can withdraw and your portfolio grows with inflation. Okay. Portfolio is still growing. And 
this is the thing when I, I first heard you say, well, I just, you know, got rid of all my real estate because I could, I could do it with, you know, something like a, a, a basically a paper investment rather than being invested in real estate. I just thought, well, of course you can, but wouldn't you rather just get the real estate returns because there's obviously way more there. Yeah. My strategy was going to be doing a bit of uh, private lending was my plan when I sold off. I figured if I sold off, I had a bunch of properties that had 30, 40% equity in them. So my return on investment was getting down close to like 14% because I was getting way under levered. Some of my properties yeah. at current market value are almost 50%. Just that, you know, how it was. And I had already quit my job. It was very hard for me to go back to the bank and say, hey, can I borrow another $2 million personally? Yeah. No, unfortunately, we're not going to give you $2 million personally. I said, okay, I'll just sell the properties off strategically, yeah. take that capital and deploy it at like 15% to private mm -hmm. lenders secured in second position against properties and get the exact same or better return for the same amount of risk level pretty much and zero work to there's never a, have a tenant call me. That's pretty appealing. There's a huge market for that. There's so many people out there that want to borrow private money. So it, it's definitely an avenue. The thing that I have a challenge with with that, because I've, I've done some private lending is uh, I love control and I feel yeah. like I'm not in control when it's that. Like I want it to be like something I can pull the strings on and I've had them go really well. Don't get me wrong. And there's a, a lot of ways to do that. But if you're a, a, a little control focused, like I am, sometimes that's not the best thing. Yes, uh, totally. That's, that's thing. That's the appeal for real estate in general. Like when you asked in the beginning, why sort of why real estate instead of stock investing, I mm -hmm. sold my stock portfolio off, stopped trading and started focusing on real estate. Cause I was in control. Yeah. I didn't rely on management expectations. I didn't rely on market conditions. Yeah. If I was buying under market value, adding value through renovation or tenant placement, I guaranteed made a great return. I was yeah. in control of that. And I like that the most. Yeah. Yeah. And you said something else uh, quite interesting too. just going back to, you said return on investment, which ultimately, I mean, in your first year you look at a return on investment, but down the road, you're looking at return on equity, right? If your property went up in value so much, now your equity grows. Well, if you're not yielding more cash flow or more appreciation in relation, yeah, your return is actually going down as a percentage. Just to clarify that, because we didn't really go in depth about return on equity in this podcast, return on equity is just the same calculation as return on investment, but it's looking at the equity you have in the property. Uh, first year return on investment is very easy to calculate because it's whatever your down payment was as the denominator and uh, whatever your return is as the numerator. So uh, returns on top, so return over investment is return on investment, while return on equity is return over your equity. The challenge is that down the road, as your property goes up in value, which we generally consider a very good thing, you are now building this massive equity stake there, which could be more efficiently utilized elsewhere. So this is why leverage is so important in real estate. We want to constantly be optimizing. So at the point where we get a little too much equity, we want to go back to the bank, pull some of that out as cash, and then we can use that to invest in some other form of investment that gets us more than the interest that we're paying. Or we can buy another property. When I buy properties, I'm typically looking to get anywhere from 25 to 35% as a turnkey investment. So that's just a benchmark that I use. Not everybody will get my results. The way we win with this is by making sure that we're making more on our new investment than we're paying to the bank. So if we're paying the bank 4% and we're making 30 or 25 or 35%, we're making the spread. And this is what I meant before when I said you might not be using your equity as efficiently as you can be. So this is why going back to the bank and refinancing, provided you have a new avenue to use that money and earn a higher return than you would pay to the bank, this is something that you should be considering. Yeah, I, I did a video on that called the, the real estate rebalance. Yeah. Most people don't look at the real estate portfolio and rebalance. Most people yeah. say, most real estate investors say, I'm going to hold this property forever. I have an emotional attachment to it. I yeah. fixed it up nicely. I like this property. And people have got properties with you know, mortgages of 200,000 when properties were six, 700,000. Their return on investment, I've seen some properties really getting three, four, five percent. I'm like, you're happy with three, four, five percent? And they just don't think about the ROI anymore. They're emotionally invested. You could get more in a mutual fund. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, uh, so if you said that exact same thing, like my friend, I have another friend, Mike, who uh, he, he deals with a lot of people uh, and he, you know, a lot of private lending, this and that. And um, he, when people tell him, oh, we, you know, we paid off our house uh, years ago. He's like, holy shit. Think about all the money you're losing. Yeah. Like literally said that, like, what do you mean we're losing money? That could be making you so much. You're losing so much money. 
Uh, and, and it just like throws people back. Like, what do you mean? I'm losing money. We're not paying interest. No, this is hurting you badly because your return on equity is terrible. If you refinanced, you could probably buy 10 more properties and your return on investment now goes through the roof. Right. And I think there's so many people out there that are like, yeah, let's pay off our, our mortgages. You know, we'll get this many properties. We'll pay them all down and we can retire. It, it depends on your ambition. How, how much work do you want to do? But provided you have somewhere to put the money, it makes more sense to re-leverage and, and put it on out there somewhere else. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Depending on what, you, what you're borrowing at. Some people borrow at 8 9% from places like Magenta. And then it's like, okay, you know what? You should pay that debt down probably. Yeah. Yeah, pay off your most expensive debt first. Yeah, uh, and then consider the tax advantage. You know, if you have tax deductible interest, don't pay that off. Pay off the tax deductible or non deductible interest first. You know, all those things. You, everyone's got their own strategy. Exactly. Uh, One I, people always ask me, well, what about how much? There's so much more cash flow from owning my rental property in cash. I have no mortgage payment. And I'm like, well, one paid off property is equivalent to about four and a half at 20% down. So yeah. after closing costs, so you've got like yeah. almost like five properties versus one, mm -hmm. five net of all of that servicing. If it's not a property in like Toronto, if it's in a, in a place where there's cash flow, you would have more cash flow. Yeah. You could get the same cash flow by owning more properties, but then guess what? Down the road, you'll have five paid off properties instead of one. And that sounds a hell of a lot better. Sure. There's an argument to be made for one property. And I say this to people a lot, one property today, if it's worth $500,000, in 30 years is worth a million. So one property today as an investment property makes you a millionaire in 30 years because the mortgage will be paid off, the property's worth a million and the whole time you were making cash flow, assuming you did it right, right? Cash flow is becoming more challenging and, and we're gonna lead into this now because I wanted to ask you about your strategy for cash flow. So why don't we start with what you look for in a property? Because I know you're buying pretty aggressively. You said this year your goal was 100 for anyone right, who didn't already know goal. that. Yeah, a little bit of a stretch goal, but hey, that's what, that's what you should do, right? 10x. Where are you at right now? We've done 13, 13 properties we've, we've bought yeah. this year. Or we're, not even, we're not even full three months into the year. So even if you're behind your goal, that's still amazing. So congrats. Yeah, man. we'll that's do 52 awesome. properties this year. Um, okay. If I stay at current trajectory between 52 and 75. So yeah. I got to step it up if I want to hit 100. That's amazing though. You're, you're killing it. So, so you got to dig into this with me. So start off, what are you looking for on a property? What's your rule? Yeah. So it depends on the type of property. We, we focus mostly on um, single family, duplex, triplex, fourplex, residential. Mm -hmm. We avoid commercial right now. We avoid mostly industrial stuff and we avoid the large multifamily. Um, not because I don't like those large multifamily, but mostly because I haven't been able to develop a competitive edge. It's very difficult to compete against institutional money on those bigger deals. Mm -hmm. um, they just, they get stupid cheap money and they can borrow at two and a half, three percent. They get really cheap cost of debt and that allows them to basically overpay. I think the cap rates are, are a little high on multifamily in, in London specifically, but with single family properties and duplexes and triplexes and student rentals and that sort of smaller, um, you know, less than 500,000 purchase price type property, I've been able to have really good cash flow. We're closing on one right now that, uh, as an example, we're buying for 384000 plus 3000 for a dog fee. So 387000 total. It'll rent for 46, it'll bring in $4,600 a month in rent. So How many units? It's a triplex. So you have solar panels on the roof. Oh, so you're getting revenue from the, the solar panels too. Correct. Is there a contract for that? There is 13, 14 years left on the contract. Oh, man. Yeah, That's 80 great. cents a kilowatt hour. Holy crap. Yeah. 450% uh, of market rate. So, so your revenue, uh, so 387, do you know what your numbers will be roughly like rents, uh, per roughly. unit? Yeah. So there'll be a four bedroom uh, up four bedroom main floor and roughly like a two bedroom in the basement. Okay. So four bed, a four bed, uh, and then a two bed. Yeah. Are you going to be doing any renos or are you just ready to go out and yeah, about 15,000 rental. So we're all in cost is like 400, 405,000. Okay. Uh, so 405 with, with reno. Yep. Cash are flow is like 1800 to 2000 a month. Net of all property taxes, mortgage, cause it's in a, in a rougher yeah. area in London, sort of near Fanshawe college. So it's one yeah. of those properties that doesn't have high property taxes. They've kept the property taxes super low, which is great. Lots yeah. Of things like that it just it was a desirable corner lot i think overall like the investor if they can make two thousand dollars a month from one deal on eighty thousand dollar down payment that's a win right oh that's great are you kicking tenants out or are they are you getting vacant possession yeah so we're getting 
half vacant possession. The other tenant, we're going to have to do keys for cash. Probably keys to for get cash. Them. I just heard that expression for the first time. That's, I love that. Um, so are you, are you, have you ever had that not work? I, I, that's probably a stupid yeah. question. Yeah. 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 That's definitely not worked before. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it works. lots of strategies. Yeah. How many, what percentage of the time has your, your uh, cash for keys worked? So I don't start with cash, uh, keys for cash. I, yeah. I moved keys for cash as a last resort. I yeah. start with just going and having a human conversation. I bring a coffee over yeah. and we have a chat about finding them a new place to live. 30% of the time, 40% of the time, they just leave willingly and they sign the end nine and 11 and they just go. Cause they know yeah. that I want to renovate the unit. I, I want them out and they just agree to it. Yeah. Uh, the next, you know, 30% of the time we have to apply a bit more pressure. We mm -hmm. may have to use things like N fives or go to the landlord tenant board. Just real quick, the terms being thrown around uh, N9, N11, N5, these are just the various government forms we have here in Ontario, Canada for evicting tenants or, or mutually agreeing that tenants will leave or filing some sort of their written warning for behavior or late payments of rent. We have a whole series of forms to start with N and basically have different purposes and we must use those. Different countries and different provinces and states will all have their own rules regarding tenant rights where we are we're, we're very very tenant friendly province which makes it more challenging for landlords which is why we've had to implement some of these creative strategies that mike's talking about right now usually before i go to the landlord tenant board i'll try the keys for cash because it's just my time yeah. to go to the board and all of that it's right. always cheaper just to offer them the differential so if their rent is like you know a thousand and market rent is 1700 there's a 700 differential i typically will pay like three months differential that's okay. no problem. So that's usually the calculation I do. If they're a really bad tenant, there's a lot of upside. I might pay a little bit more. I start obviously low. I start with like one month differential. Mm -hmm. So then the pitch to the investor who's buying this property with me, it's like, if we have to pay this person a thousand dollars to leave and we get that money back in 1.5 months, what's the return on investment of putting out that thousand dollars? It's like well, 900%. You know, yeah. Like a thousand percent almost yeah. a year. That's a great use of capital. And so it's an easy yeah. conversation to have and it's a win. Yeah. And that's something people get really emotional about and you have to go back to a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet or a, a calculator, a pen and paper and say, no, if I'm being objective about this, it's worth handing this person even sometimes might even be $5,000 depending on yeah. what the, what the rent could be. Uh, right. Cause you have to think it's not just return on investment, which will be great in most scenarios. It's what the bank's going to see when they look at your property. Cause the bank is looking at income. That could be the difference between getting the mortgage or not that which could be keeping the property or not. So, uh, yeah. so many variables there. So let's just say hypothetically, you get everybody out. What do you think your rents are going to be per unit? So the, the top four bed, what do you figure? Roughly like 1795, 1795 plus utilities plus hydro. Yeah. Um, okay. which is, uh, just electric and water on one bill or are you saying just electric? Just electric. There's no way to separate the water. It's just one water coming into the building. So I would have okay. to pay that. There's nothing I could do. It's not it worth doing. It has two, two furnaces, two gas lines. So I could theoretically split the gas. Okay. I probably won't. Like the student market typically doesn't want to pay. They don't want to pay that yet. Gas, so I'll typically just cover it. It's not hugely expensive anyway. So it'll be a student rental then. So four bedroom student it, rental. We could go either way with it. Um, we may go partial, may, may not. I could put a family in there and get a pretty good rent too. I got a four bedroom unit. It's relatively mm -hmm. nice inside. Um, so yeah, there's lots of parking, decent amount of green space, good backyard. Oh, good. Yeah. I think it, it could work either for either play a little bit more cash flow for the student rental, but then you have higher insurance costs and higher turnover. So from a work perspective, I have to spend more time basically replacing yeah. the tenancies. So it's, it just kind of depends on each property is slightly different and we just run the numbers and we say, okay, you know, yeah. it's a headache for the extra hundred bucks a month or 200 bucks a month. If it's a clear cut, like $500 more a month to go student rental, we'll probably go that route. Just mm -hmm. because the cash flow is that much better. Um, yeah, this is just a sample deal. The nice thing about a big deal like this, like these $400,000 type deals that bring in 4,500 a month in rent or 5,000 a month in rent is there's so much spread because your mortgage payments like 1,500, 1,800, depending on the interest rate you get yeah. on your mortgage. That's amazing. And you're getting that kind of spread where you're getting, I like to look for like two, two and a half times on mortgage payment in rents. That's sort of like the target. Okay. If I'm buying the small, we do like single family as well. We bought a single family here in like a bunch of single families, but one of them was like 125,000. Yeah. Here in London, it's a detached house, three bedroom, one bath. We added an extra bath. So we made it three bed, two bath. We're running it for 16, 
1695 plus all utilities. They pay hydro, water, gas, everything. So that's, that's like almost 2% rule, one and a half percent rule plus utilities. Yeah. So that's, that's an example of like seven, 800 bucks a month in cash flow on a $25,000 down payment. That's really great to bring. I bring that to an investor and they're like, holy moly, this is amazing. And by the way, when we get the tenant in there, get the other tenant out, put the new tenant in, clean the property up with those kinds of rents, the property is now worth 200. So right. basically by increasing cash flow, we automatically adjust the value because we know we can sell it at a six or seven cap rate. And, and so you, you mentioned you are doing this with investors that you're partnering in together. Um, yeah, you guys, own capital anymore. yeah. Yeah. That's a great strategy. I mean, down the road as an investor, you just end up not using, otherwise you run out, right? Eventually you have to start relying it's on it. It's funny. Other. Like when I didn't yeah. have any capital and I was just starting out, no one would lend me anything. No one would, would partner with me. But now that I've got, you know, I could go close like 10 properties myself right now. I have lots of capital. I have so much. And now I don't even need to use my capital. It's like, if I can have that conversation with the investor, like, Hey, I'm going to buy this property. If you don't want it, that's okay. Like I'll just buy it. And that's what I've done. Like on yeah. the 50 deals or so we've done, I closed on like three of them just myself. Every property I buy, I buy with the intention to buy myself. And if an investor wants to come in and put up the capital and get basically 75% of the cash flow and 50% of the, the upside on the depreciation roughly, then that's a yeah. huge win for, for them. And, and I'm happy to, to build that relationship, build that social capital. I've got investors now that you know will sing my praises if I double their money in a year. They'll yeah. be loyal for life. And so that's why I give up the profit. And I know it's probably not the soundest business decision. It'd be a lot cheaper if I just borrowed the capital and Mm -hmm. I asked it myself, but for, for me, it's not all about the money. It's also about giving back. And we started this company to help other people unlock fire, right. And help other people get financial independence. Well, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty rare to be able to find somebody who will help you invest in real estate and, and take all the, the headaches away. That's pretty rare. For so little, most people yeah. want the 50, 50. Oh yeah. Cash no, or, or, or more so or more. Yeah. Um, Totally. Um, okay. So, so you were saying, just getting back to this example and we'll, we'll continue on. What do you figure your cash flow is going to be on all that? Have you crunched a number like your net cash flow around 2000 after your, after your mortgage around 2000 after property taxes, insurance, everything. Okay. So, so around 2000 and then, um, you're going to be paying off your mortgage, which I've, I don't know if you've ever done this, but, uh, my friend says 3% is a good a good estimation for how much of your principal What's you pay off. 3% of the principal every year. 3% of your principal a year with oh, okay. roughly. It's not, it's not a science, but cocktail napkin uh, numbers. Nice. So let's just go with some simplified numbers here. Let's say that your purchase and renovation total is $400,000. And let's go ahead and assume that you're borrowing 80% of that from the bank. So that's approximately $320,000 as a mortgage. Your cash flow is 2000 a month. So that works out to $24,000. Then your principal pay down will be approximately $10,500 uh, a month. And you know, for those of you who like to use the spreadsheet, go ahead. Uh, there are mortgage calculators online. Let's just assume that's the number here because that's approximately what it will be. And then you're going to get appreciation as well. And in London lately, that's been insane, but let's just say it went normal. Uh, what do you figure? I, just, for appreciation? I, I always assume zero. So I just say, if we get a, we get appreciation, it's a bonus, but we don't buy for appreciation. You're not buying that way. When it happens, that's awesome. Yeah. We're going to double our money a, a second time, but we don't yeah. play for that. We don't play in that game. It's probably worth like in the MLS right now, like four ninety nine. So they get a hundred thousand upside right away and they close. So instant equity. Yeah. About a hundred grand. So they double their money right when they close They're down. I tell them they're gonna double their down payment right away just because it's under market value mm -hmm. at, on the buy. And then the cash. So we look for like, Basically, I try to get 100% ROI. I try to double the person's money in one to two years. But if yeah. we can get sooner than that, that's a bonus. Well, it looks like you're on track on this one, even if you didn't, like if you didn't even account for any instant equity, like by buying off market, you know, finding a deal. They're all off market. All, yeah. all, all 13 this year. Which is another, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll cross that in a second here. But uh, okay, so 24,000 in cash flow, 10,500 10, in pay down approximately on an $80,000 down payment. If you divide that out, that's 43% return on investment just based on cash flow and principal pay down. That's not even factoring in your instant equity, not factoring in the property value growth. So uh, that's pretty crazy. Those are excellent numbers. I'm sure you've got tons of investors that are, uh, that are interested in that. Okay. So yeah, my, sorry, this deal's already taken. Yeah. Yeah. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, I, I, I say that to some people who come on, I'm like, you're setting an unreasonable expectation for people uh, when they're telling I've me. I've got a couple of deals right now that are, that are decent yeah. that decent haven't been like that. Yet. Yeah. 
Okay. So question for you. So these off market deals, what's your strategy? How are you finding them? Especially in London right now where it's a, it's been a seller's market for quite some time. Uh, how are you finding these off market deals? What are you doing to make it happen? Yeah. So there's a few different strategies that we use. Um, I'm partnered with someone. So technically I'm about to get licensed as a, a realtor here. So I technically can't buy private deals that are exposing the comps and explain to everyone market value. So mm -hmm. um, I have a, a business partner who owns 50% of the company with me. He's mm -hmm. actively looking as well. We have partners with a few wholesalers. So I've mentored a few people through YouTube and because I've trained them how to wholesale, that person comes back, gives me first right on every deal that they get. And we get a basically a discount on the, the wholesale fee and we buy this, buy these properties from them exclusively. So I have wholesalers that bring me exclusive deals and mm -hmm. in return, I, I, uh, you know, help, I've helped mentor them and teach them the process of wholesaling through like the education online. And I make sure they get paid and it's a quick decision. Like they call me and it's like, I'll take the deal. No problem. You don't need a buyer's list. I got so you, you. You've done some networking. You've done some training of people teaching them how to wholesale. Like what are you training them on how to do, how to, how to put out ads or how to. Yeah. Like all the things, right. The Facebook ads and the Instagram ads and teaching yeah. the GG and yeah. the marketplace and a big one's just door knocking. Like we have a ton of success networking and door knocking and referrals are huge. People will call you and say, Oh, Hey, my grandma wants to sell her place. Like I'd be happy to make 750 bucks. Can mm -hmm. I refer her to you? And I'd, we'd be like, yeah, that'd be, I'll hand you off to my friend who does wholesaling and he takes care of that. Um, so yeah, we do. That's how we get a lot of private deals is just through the people that we're, we're networked with because I buy so many properties, like one to two properties a week. And because we have that huge pile of like, we have a pool of cash, kind of ready to go anytime we can close in cash. We don't even need financing. So that yeah. gives, gives me a good pitch to the wholesalers who want to get rid of this deal as quick as they can and get paid. So that's yeah. been a, a big, big thing. Um, I used to do some, some, a lot of private buying. I can't do it like again, be, being a realtor, it's very difficult for me to do it now. Mm -hmm. I, uh, there's still deals in the MLS or there were last year. Anyway, I haven't really been on the MLS very much recently. I'll be honest. I, the last time I was on there, I was like, wow, these are all terrible. Um, yeah, they don't look great right now. No, they, it's no. just not great on MLS. But uh, last year I was, it was also not great on MLS last year. All the properties were on multiple offers and I was picking up that one for 125,000. As an example, that single family detached house. We, we picked that for 125,100, I think we went a hundred dollars over asking, put it in an offer early and the other four buyers were spooked because they saw it was going over asking and the house needed a little bit of renovation and stuff like that. And so they backed away and the agent purposely listed at 40,000 under market. And so we got the property 40,000 under market on an MLS, just a oh, wow. hundred dollars over ask or a dollar over ask. So for a long time, I was just doing the dollar over ask strategy, no conditions, quick close two weeks. And we were getting, we were getting, we were beating people who were bidding 10,000 more than us just because our conditions were just better. We'd close a dollar over ask though. Like dude, oh, just because they can't disclose the purchase price, right? So the real but estate they have to say that they received an offer over asking price. So they can say that. I didn't realize that they were allowed to say that. I thought they had to just say they had to, they got an offer. Yeah. I don't know. Like I've heard agents say that. I don't know if it's like if they legally can, but they, I have heard them say like, we got an offer. It's over asking do your best or whatever. that's the kind of thing I've I've heard Interesting. Yeah, I guess they. I guess they could. I. I know. Obviously, probably not allowed. Probably a not. lot of things happen that shouldn't happen. I. I know. I used to get beaten on bids by this guy uh, that would go in and meet with this. Like he'd bring his agent. Well, no, sorry, oh, he was agent, and he'd go meet with the seller agent and the seller always. Every deal he did, he always met in person. He. He insisted on it. There was no deal that didn't happen where he's like, "No, I want to present my offer in person." And he had this funny way I'd, I'd have bid on the property and he'd have this funny way of just bidding a hundred or $700 more than I did. And we all know what, what really happened right. there. Yeah. I don't know what happened or who got a little wad of cash, but yeah, these things do happen. Right. And it is something that you, you know, you can't be naive to it. So that's why it's so much more powerful if you can find these people before they go to market. Yes. So, Cause then they're thinking, Hey, I'm saving commission. Um, now you said, you know, it's harder to do as a realtor. I've heard other people say, Hey, being a realtor is an asset in this because I can say, Hey, look, I am a professional. I do buy a lot of houses for myself. I know this market, you know, and, and they just level it. Look, this is what I'm doing. You don't want to list, you know, I need to make money here too. And for sure. 
there's uh, as a realtor legally like rico's stance on it is that you have to disclose disclose disclose, disclose. yeah so you just have to say hey i'm out here to make a profit um yeah. i know market value after everything's done is 200 i can offer you yeah. 150 here are the comps in the neighborhood even still though there have been cases i was looking online at some cases where realtors bought properties under market and made a forty thousand dollar profit on a flip and the judge determined that they were taking advantage of the client and they got half, they they sued them and got half that profit so that's yeah. that's a scary thing being a realtor there's some disadvantages there are some huge advantages though for instance i can sell all of our properties in our portfolio at any time right i don't have to use another realtor for that um yeah. i'm tapped in for instance i can i can go list if you wanted to ever look for for investors this is kind of like a sneaky little thing i can go list like 10 of my properties in our portfolio without really the intention to sell like i list them for really high price like 700,000 or something crazy when yeah. i know they're worth five or i think they're worth 500 just to see if a toronto buyer will buy it but I get a lot of calls from investors with stupid money. And those investors, guess what? They have a lot of money. They're looking at these $700,000 houses that have terrible cap rates. I can have a conversation yeah. with them and say, hey, let me get you into something better. So yeah. it's, a lead, it's a lead generation actually for us to find investors and private money. That's clever. Yeah, I was gonna ask you why do it? Cause I, when, when you said you were doing it, especially buying all the private ones, I'm like, that's probably a disadvantage in a way. I know some people find a way to turn their weakness into a strength, which is totally, totally, I think. It, it complements everything. Yeah. Like yeah. my plan is to have, you know, a partner on the realtor side as well. So I'm not just mm -hmm. being a realtor all day long, right? I've got people who help me if I get a lot of listings that can't handle the open houses. So I would, I would delegate as much as I can yeah. outside, but access to data is huge. Technically, you can't get access to the logins without being a realtor. Your realtor can't give you access to that. You have to ask them to pull comps, which is yeah. quite, quite a pain, right? Um, so access to data in the flash is really helpful. Um, I have a lot, of, a lot of my clients will be wholesalers who will call me and ask, ask me for my opinion. And so being an agent just gives me that expert authority, right? That access to data and then also brands me as an expert in the space. Yeah. So no, I some advantages. I think there's huge advantages to that. I, I will have to say that I, I do find it a hassle to have to ask a realtor for any information. I love just being able to log in, but yeah. I can't see the MLS. I still have my mortgage license, so I do have access to a system that lets me pull land registry so I can see what things have sold nice. for, mortgages, that kind of thing, which I find incredibly valuable. However, I can't see like the MLS system, what's sold on market versus off market, old listings. Those things are really valuable info, which you know you just you don't have. So yeah, there's there's pros and cons to both sides. Our our friends in the in the states, they can see so much more information. Like you yes, can, can in the states, I used to own a couple of properties in Ohio, and I could literally search the owners of properties through the tax registry online. I can do that right now from my computer, figure out who owns this, and send them a, a direct mail letter handwritten to their name. You know, that's that power that they have there, uh, you know, our friends, uh, just across the border can do, do a lot of things. So anything I like to say that anything you're listening to on this show, uh, you can apply it even, even easier down there. Very Obviously true. there's, there's some differences totally, but you can definitely apply it. So the other thing is pocket listings were huge. Like yeah. that's the other source of last year. Those were a lot of our deals. I would just get it networked in with like 20 agents mm -hmm. and the agents are just, I don't want to say lazy, but People just want to go with the easiest route, right? So they'll call you and be like, hey, can you come take a look at this property with me? I would love it if you'd come make an offer. And I just go in and make an offer before it hits MLS. So there's no competing. We just give them full ask and the deal's done. Or they, yeah. they maybe misprice it. it. Happens all the time. Agents make mistakes and they misprice properties. So we get in there and we, we get them for a little bit of a deal. But yeah, pocket listings is basically, it's like a private, I consider a pocket listing a private deal because it's never hit MLS. It's off market. Yeah, it's off market. It's just an agent has brought that off market. Yeah. I like that. So why don't we dig into a little bit about why, what's the logic, what's the psychology of somebody who sells to you off market versus just listing it? Why doesn't their realtor just want to go to market? I know you said they just want it done easy. Why don't they want to go to market and just, you know, price it low and get a bidding war? Why don't they want to do that? In this, in this market, I mean, they probably just want to list it, but yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, there was a bit better case to be made last year when things weren't moving as quickly as they are right now in the spring. So this strategy will work better for me in the summer when things slow down, people go on holidays. That's a good mm -hmm. time to buy as well. Seasonally speaking, the best time to buy is October to January, start of January. Um, average okay. purchase price is 12% lower in London. Um, that's on the MLS. That's just open. Um, yeah. So we know for a fact that houses are about 10% discount on average versus the heat is high of the spring. So you just don't buy. Like I'm just not interested in buying an MLS right now. I just have no interest. Yeah, just wait, wait for fall basically. Yeah, I wait for fall, wait for winter. There are people 
Can you give me an example of some situations of people that are just in a situation where they just straight up don't want to sell on the market? Like they just, they would rather just get it done. Like what's yeah. An- so I guess a good example of that would be, well, on the, on the wholesale side, we get a lot of people who have really messy houses full of stuff. They don't want to have an open house. They don't want people going through their house. Um, oftentimes they, they've got some sort of issue, right? Some sort of problem. They've got bad tenants and they can't get access and they get access one time maybe. And we get through there and we see it, we take a quick video and that's it. They like that, that it's, maybe they're from Toronto. A lot of times the, we're buying from people who are out of, out of market. Maybe they're from Vancouver. They've got a house here in London. They don't want to manage it anymore. They're down visiting their son for a day and they can show us the property and then they're going back home. They don't have time to show it to a realtor and have a right. realtor get in there. And maybe their family member is living there right now and wants to move out, but their family member doesn't want them to do showings or put it on MLS or expose their, their dirty secrets, you know, in their house and their closets and whatever else. So you're, are you saying like, I'm trying to, trying to get at this to help some of our listeners to like what they could look for in their markets. If they wanted to find stuff, like say they're in a similar situation where it's hard to find a deal. Are there any t- telltale signs that you can see? Like say you were going through a, a neighborhood and you're th- thinking, which, which houses should I door knock or, or which property should I look up the owner and, and try and call them? Is there anything you, you would look for? Yeah. So I look for deferred maintenance on a property. Mm-hmm. Deferred maintenance is basically um, eaves troughs, haven't been cleaned out. Uh, maybe there's, you drive by and the steps are all kind of rough. Maybe they had some paint peeling on the side of their house. Just look for cosmetic issues to the front of the house, things they've delayed fixing that they should have been fixing you yeah. know, the last two, three years. Those people tend to be ones who are absentee landlords. Absentee landlords are usually absentee for a reason. They're out of town or maybe they're just fed up with the real estate portfolio and they want to break. I've met people who have 10 properties that had them for 20 years and all of a sudden they're just tired. They just don't want to go to their properties anymore. They just want to retire. That's a good buying opportunity for someone. So you go around and you find those types of properties. They're yeah. great. Um, bad tenants and properties too. that are really messy out front. You got a bunch of toys out front and stuff. Maybe they have a rough tenant in there. That's a great opportunity. If you want to solve basically problems equal profit. So you look for problems. I look for people who have bad tenants, uh, properties that have delayed maintenance. They don't have the money to fix the property up. They've got deferred maintenance. They've delayed doing certain maintenance. Um, all of those types of things. You can look up, see if people are behind their taxes. You can look in the system and see who's got a notice from the city with the rental license program and see who's been getting in trouble. You can pull yeah. some of that record. So you could find people that way. There are a lot of different strategies you can so use to find people who are distressed. You can find uh, the tax information. I thought you could only do that in the States. You can do that here too. I, I know of a wholesaler who does that. I'm not quite sure how they do that. I think they pay for the records. Um, but yeah, you, you theoretically can do that. And you can get into with realtors who also sell uh, bank foreclosed properties or people who have second mortgage mm-hmm. uh, mortgages on properties and then they basically default. And so I've met some agents who have given me that sort of advanced information or they have a mortgage on a property. They want to get their 200 grand back. They say, you know, he hasn't paid me in six months. I'm going to take over, control this property. Will you buy it? I just want to get my money back. I don't care if they get any money for themselves. I just want to make my 200 grand back that I lent on this yeah. property. And so that's when I can just get the, the person who defaulted on the mortgage and get a really good deal. They're less common in Canada, but they exist. I've, uh, I've bought one that way. It was going power sale and, and basically I, I bought it just before it went to that, that, that yeah. point. So yeah, that's definitely a, a good way to get a property. I like what you said, going after deferred maintenance, basically mismanaged properties, finding yeah. that person that it's just a headache, like should just show that property to clean it up. Like they just want to be done with it. And it's sort of an irrational thing. Like, let's just get it gone. Um, so that's, that's an example of a win-win where you're winning, you're getting a property property for a, a price that you want it. And the person selling is winning because they don't want to deal with it anymore. And you're taking it off their plate. So exactly. That's, that's great. Right. And that, that's something that, that can be applied to any market. I've heard a stat that probably about 5% of people fall into that category, 5% of house sales, whereas the other 95%, they're going to want to get the max dollar. So I guess that's one in 20. So if you go out today and you knock on a hundred doors, maybe you find five that are- I don't know if I agree with that stat. I think people say that they want purchase price, but in my experience buying privately in the last like five, six years, I've been doing it. People say that purchase price is their most important factor. It almost never is. There's Mm -hmm. always an emotional reason they would sell for less. There's almost always a, in a lot of cases, I've had someone get a second offer for four or $5,000 more and they went with me and I said, well, yeah. why'd you go with me? I believed you can close and I liked you. Oh yeah. That's that totally. Was worth, that was worth $5,000 to me. 
we have a relationship here. So people often, especially yeah. older baby boomers, they've got, you know, a million bucks oh, yeah. in assets. They don't care about an extra $5,000. They care is it going to close quickly. Do I like the person who's taking this property over? It is very emotional. Real estate is more emotional than it is True. transactional, I, I think, I believe. So you're getting into the conversation, like when you speak to a person as a person, and you don't just start with how many square foot is your house and, and what do you want for it, uh, yes. where you go in and say, hey, like, you know, how are you? Um, you know, I heard you wanted to sell your house. Like, what's going on in your life? You know, you know what are you planning? And you need to kind of just get to know them a little bit. I think that, yeah, you do build that rapport. And, and then if they see you treat them like a human, why wouldn't they want to deal with you? The other thing I'll say is, yeah, absolutely. Like, knowing who's buying from you, knowing that they have money, knowing that they can close and perform and have a reputation for doing so. That's big, too. So if you're just getting started for somebody out there, just getting started, have your ducks in a row, you know, go to the more, go to the bank first. If you're planning on bank financing and get an approval or, you know, contact your private lender, figure out what your strategy is. So you can go in with full confidence saying, I'm, you know, I've got the cash ready to go. I, I may or may not use a mortgage, but you know, either way we've got it, got it ready. Fortunate for us, it's just a firm deal is a firm deal. So. Right. There's most deals are firm these days on, on the MLS, I think. Yeah, that's what it's turned into, right? And think about how risky that is for for the average buyer. I mean, risky. I've bought I've bought many properties that way, but I'm somebody who understands how to renovate a property and understands if something happens, I'll be able to deal with it. Uh, but there's a lot of people out there, I think, that have probably put themselves in a bit of hot water doing that. I just saw a property go the other day for about eighty thousand over ass. They had it listed for two twenty nine. Really bad neighborhood bungalow house uh really really unattractive in a bad neighborhood but decent on the inside the basement was too low to be finished so we're talking like 800 square foot of space that's usable and it went for 309 in london which is you know some markets people are like oh that's that's cheap whatever but to me like that's that's a property that that would have gone in the hundred and probably 60 range three years ago yeah <laughs> now it's like crazy in london People come here, they don't understand them. They don't understand the market. So they think a Richmond Gates, you know, downtown property is the same as an East London property. Well, they're both in London, like five minutes apart when, you know, in fact, in East London, or you have some bad pockets in London. I think you're referring to East London, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Right? So it's, yeah. people just don't understand. They're from out of market and their realtors are from Toronto too. And so they don't have any idea either. So many realtors I've talked to from Toronto and other markets come here and have no idea trying to sell like these multi yeah. you've probably seen that 12 plex on king edward it's been for sale forever for a million bucks yes Just, i feel like i uh, i do it's a terrible that. deal and there's so many agents coming down trying to get their clients to buy it like this is a great area like king edward if you're from london you know king edward is not a good area yeah let's let's try and give people a few takeaways so so somebody out there wants to go get out and start finding deals what would your number one recommendation to them be the one the most valuable takeaway you could give them the more properties you see the greater the chance you'll have a, a deal. So just see a lot of properties. I knock on doors, call agents, call people. Mm -hmm. The more times you go out to properties, the more times you go to networking events, the more your chance of finding a good deal. It's just a numbers game. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily finding, you know, if I find a hundred properties, it's not necessarily because I'm any, well, maybe it's a little bit because of my, I'm a bit better closer and stuff like that. But mostly it's, it's just, I'm out there grinding every day looking at deals and the more deals you put in front of yourself, the more your chance to be exposed to a good one. Very well said. I definitely agree. And the networking part's huge too. I mean, obviously social media has played a, uh, played a, a role in your being known as somebody that that's looking. That's why we met. There's a, there's a lot of value there and that's totally a, a topic for another, another day. So we don't get carried away too much here, but anyway, so, just to wrap up, Mike, if somebody wanted to, uh, to get in touch with you, what would be the best way for them to do so? So the best way would probably be to hit me up on Instagram. My name is Mike Rosehart. So you just type in Mike Rosehart. My YouTube channel is a great way if you want to. I've got like 300 hours of free content on there. I go live for the Wise Wall Show every Wednesday. I should have you on the Wise Wall Show. Yeah, sounds good. Just let me Come know. Down and, and do it. We get like a couple hundred people tune in. Okay, so just my name, Mike Rosehart. You find me on on YouTube, on Instagram, um, 7,040 subscribers right now on YouTube and growing. So I'm super excited about yeah. what YouTube has been able to, to do for, for helping people, honestly. Like it's been less about helping me and more about helping other people. Instagram has been great for, for actually helping me. I've got a lot of people direct message me mm -hmm. with uh, you know, deals they had to sell or they wanna lend me money or they wanna invest, become investors. So a lot of people through Instagram has been super fruitful. 
my slogan on YouTube, 150 videos, which I end all my videos with is the secret to unlocking a wealthier you is to spend less, earn more and maximize your returns. So those are the three levers you have to play with at the end of the day. And I think real estate is the best at maximizing returns. It's the best lever because of cheap debt and leverage. You can yeah. get five to one returns. So if your ROA, your return on asset is eight or 10%, an eight or 10 cap property and you're levered five to one, you get 40% return on investment before appreciation yeah. or arbitrage, which are also levered five to one. So a 5% appreciation yeah. turns into 25% return on your actual down payment investment. So that's why I talk about real estate on the channel, but it started out as just, again, personal finance. How yeah. do you, how do you improve? There's not really a better way to, to invest your money than real estate. It's not passive. I mean, people say no. it is, it's not, uh, it's active. It can be it can be mostly passive, but you're still in an active business. And the sooner you accept that, the better off you'll be. But it can, it's, you can getting, it's getting better. With, I, like, I have active managers now that manage my properties for yeah. me, so I'm not getting tenant techs. I'm thankful for that. But again, it's still as active. I'm managing the management. It's a business. It's a business. It but you can automate businesses to a certain degree and, and as long as you keep an oversight. So that's, that's awesome. Okay, so Mike, a couple of rapid fire questions. Favorite book? Ah, good question. Uh, for me, it's gonna be Early Retirement Extreme. Early retirement by Jacob Lund Fisker. It's a really radical, you know, Renaissance man type do it yourself book. Mm -hmm. But he, he basically was the first to write about like the 4% safe withdrawal rate, I think, and codify a lot of the early retirement terminology. Okay. Nice. One weird fact or interesting fact about yourself. Hmm. It's a weird, interesting fact about me. I don't know. I, I've got my second daughter's on the way, uh, second child's on the way. I got two that's kids. Okay. Well, that's sort of interesting. That interesting. No, that's great. Yeah. And congratulations. Also very interesting about you, right? Um, most people are, are waiting much longer and you're already two kids at the age of, I think you're like 27 now. Is I'm 26 right? right now. 26. Wow. Yeah. Off to a quick start with everything. <laughs> yeah. If I just literally, I was running the numbers. If I just grow at 13% return on my investment for the next 40 years, I'll be a billionaire. 40, 45 years. So like billionaire is actually possible. 13% isn't even like that hard to achieve. That's pretty cool, man. That's, that's really cool. I was looking at that. I'm like, that would be a cool, yeah. just because I started so young, right? The compound interest, a dollar invested at 20 is $64 when you're you know, 65. It's a, it's a very impressive story, man. So uh, save it now start young guys. If you're just start, watching this start yeah. today, like take action today, <laughs> save 10 bucks, a hundred bucks, something today. And then mm -hmm. move forward. that's how I was able to become Canada's youngest early retiree is because I was starting young. Did you ever read the slight edge? I'm trying to think of who, uh, who wrote someone that. sent me that book last night on Instagram. You actually like believe it. it or not. Yeah. That's, they, that's a that, weird like you, you need to read this book. So I'm going to check that out definitely would resonate with you. It's not going to teach you anything new, I don't think, but it will resonate with you for sure. It's going to motivate uh, me, pump me up. Maybe, yeah, maybe. It's, it never hurts. It's the compounding effect. It's really like, it's, a, it's lessons in the compounding effect in, in a person's life. Like all the little things you do on a daily basis mean nothing in a single day, but yes. they mean something over time. And you're either compounding yourself in the wrong direction or you're compounding yourself in the right direction. Uh, right. Whether it's working out, whether it's saving money, whether it's eating right, you know, all those things. So I'm, I'm still, uh, uh, that's an interesting fact. I, I have a six pack and I'm 26 pack. years old. <laughs> it's more the people who lose it when they hit like 30. That yeah, was a wake up call for me actually, because I had gotten uh, significantly over what my current weight is. Uh, and I felt very gross and, you know, I just got bogged down with life and what have you. And I saw all the people around me, people who graduated from Ivy, you know, university with me all packing on weight. I'm like, is this what happens at 30? Oh, I hope not. Oh God, I hope not. <laughs> no, no, you just gotta, you gotta stay you true. Hit the gym, right? Course. Yeah, hit the gym. Like the key is being in, enjoying your life, right? If you're enjoying yeah. your day, day to day and making time for what's important, that won't happen. Uh, but retirement helps that, right? You do what you love with your life. Yeah, that's what it's about, right? Because you didn't just sit around. You, you got back to work doing something that, that drove you. That's what it's all about, right? It's not about sitting around doing nothing because we can't do that as human beings. It's, we'll get bored. We'll go crazy. Uh, Every day is a choice. Yeah. At the end of the day, I like to live by that motto. Have the choice, right. Awesome. Okay. Well, Mike, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to be on the show today. I know it's an interesting story. For some people, it's going to be hard to believe, but uh, I'm sure they'll do their research on you and see it's all true. So thanks again, and uh, we'll have to have you on again sometime. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Just a quick wrap up, I would highly recommend going back to the part of the podcast where Mike talks about the motivations behind sellers selling their properties and how it's not all about the money. There are many people out there who believe that 
uh, there's no point in door knocking or, you know, what's, what's the point in doing such a thing when people just want to get the highest dollar. But when you really dig down to it, everybody has an emotional reason to want to sell. If we can understand people better, there's an opportunity for us to get a deal in a true win-win scenario that's not just about price. I thought that was really cool. I'm really glad that he came on the show and brought that up. For those of you who have not yet rated and reviewed this podcast, please take a moment to do that on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, wherever you're listening. Please take a moment. It's going to help more people get this podcast in their hands and uh, allow me to get many, many more guests and uh, ultimately spread the word and build a community around this podcast. So do that now. I would really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. If you want to reach me, it's at the Andrew Hines on Instagram, and my last name is spelled Heinz, H-I-N-E-S. Thanks, I'll see you on the next one.